Welcome. Good evening. Um, very late uh, in London. Um, I want to welcome everybody to our first lecture of the academic year. Um, it's, it's a true pleasure and honor to have Elsie Oyusu to be the first speaker for this year. Um, her lecture, Architecture from Empire to Independence. Um, Elsie is, is OBE, uh, is an architect, artist, and urban designer. Her project includes the UK, the UK Supreme Court and London's Green Park Station. She was running up for the RIBA presidency in, in 2018, being reelected to the RIBA, no, known as RIBA National Council. Current projects include a studio residency complex for the artist Jin Kan Shonibare, uh, CBE in Lagos, the new Kumasi City um, Hall and Royal Museum in Ghana, and a low energy home in Sussex, England. She's the director of Chess, of Chess Ghana, which promotes inward investment and good governance in Ghana with a special, with a special focus on education for children and young people through the creative industries. In 2003, she was honored by the Queen for service to architecture and funding chair of the Society of Black Architects. Uh, as I said, it's a pleasure to have Elsie. Um, is it, Elsie um, is that kind of breed of architect, what I call citizen architect, which is not the, 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 it takes seriously the role of being an architect and what it means in shaping citizen society. And I think in the current times that we're looking so desperately for ideas and energy to be positive, for change and to move us in the right direction. Um, it's hard to imagine anybody better than Elsie to be our first speaker this year. So Elsie, first and foremost, thank you so much for staying up so late. I know you're in London time. Uh, it's eight hours, away, so it's 3 a.m. So very early good morning for you. So again, um, such an honor and, and such a pleasure to have you with us. And um, the screen is all yours. Once again, thank you and welcome to Saya. Uh, well, thank you so much, Anna, and it's a real pleasure to be with you and your students. Um, and, um, and it's a, a privilege to be the first um, lecturer of your series, of this series. We're going to see a series of slides, first of all. Um, and um, so, starting with the first slide, um, the Gallery for Returning Treasures. Um, according to a Ford UK recently published re uh, Return of Icons report, estimates suggest up to 90% of sub-Saharan Africa's historical, material, cultural heritage is held outside the continent as a result of colonization, conquest, plunder and theft, as well as legitimate trade and exchange. The report calls for return have gained momentum following recommendations of the groundbreaking Sar Savoir report commissioned by French President Emmanuel Macron in 2019. This calls for the full restitution of works in French museums, museum collections plundered from former African colonies, in quotation marks. In 1996, as a young architect, I led a student design competition for the Gallery for Returning Treasures, GRT. This ideas competition was co-sponsored by the Africa Reparations Movement, ARM, led by Bernie Grant MP, one of the first black MPs elected to the UK Parliament. The competition was co-sponsored by the Royal Institute of British Architects, RIBA. Nearly 25 years later, the concept is reborn as a new gallery in Ghana within the Kumasi City Hall complex. In the punitive campaign of 1873 to 1874, Governor General Sir Garnet Wolsey's army raided Kumasi, the ancient capital of the Ashanti Kingdom in the then Gold Coast in West Africa. The British troops destroyed the city looted large quantities of royal and sacred regalia. For his efforts, Wolsey was granted the freedom of the city of London and awarded a sort of honor. He was made an honorary DCL of Oxford and Cambridge universities. On return home, he was appointed inspector general 
of auxiliary forces from the 1st of April, 1874. Due to resistance to British rule in South Africa, he was appointed as the governor general, governor and commander general there in 1875. 25 years later, 1900, Nana Ya Asantua, the queen mother of Ajusu in the Ashanti Empire, led a campaign known as the War of the Golden Stool against British colonialism. Ya Asantua and 15 of her closest advisors were captured and sent into exile in the Seychelles with the Ashanti King Prempe and his principal advisors. The present king, his Royal Highness Otumfu Nana Oseta II, has expressed his wish for the return of these treasures. Many were bought at auction by British cultural institutions, including the VNA, and are now the subject of a global movement for rest restitution. This movement has gained momentum and significance with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and are the subject of the return of ICOM's report mentioned earlier by a Ford UK and also by the South Savoir report. With the rise of BLM comes renewed interest in the history of the British Empire, slavery, colonialism, independence, together with the reappraisal of the role of art and culture in our human civilizations. Roads Must Fall reflects a new awareness of the importance of art in the public domain. The GRT competition brief stated that the building was to be a staging post between the legacy of the past, the slave trade, colonialism, migration, and underdevelopment, and the hope for the future when the people of the African diaspora move beyond tutelage to independence, new pride, and dignity. Intended to be more than a gallery and museum, the GRT and its artifacts will be more than a conventional collection. The gallery is about to display. It's about data, information, academic excellence and exchange. Display is not only of the artifacts, but importantly, of their symbolism of their history. The, M the British Empire dimension of the vast international trade in people and objects, as well as the increasing consciousness of the need for restitution, reconciliation, and reparations. In 1995, Liverpool Dock was the site for the GRT complex. This location referred to the city's history as the hub of the slave trade, a distillation and condenser of its tragic essence. The building would hover, if only metaphorically, on the built edge between land and sea. The symbolic significance of this transition resonated with the transitions from the horror of the past and pointed to the optimistic opportunities of the new millennium. The architecture of the building, reminiscent of the joyous celebrations of Ghana's path to independence in 1957 through 1960 and 1961 of the Queen's State visit. It was to reflect an aspiration towards a likeness of being while pursuing the seriousness of visionary purpose. This was echoed in the choice of site at the edge of the River Mersey, at the end of the historical Middle Passage. Liverpool is a city whose former wealth was built on the slave trade. Its future well being must, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, depend on a collaboration between the sons and daughters of former slaves and those of former slave owners. Reborn in Kumasi as part of the Kumasi City Hall complex, the new GRT deals simultaneously with questions which touch 
on notions of dissettlement and resettlement. The artifacts taken from their original use in culture are currently viewed in conditions of alienation as the bounty and treasure of art, the rich pickings of colonialism. Under the Return of Icons program, many treasures will be returned to their original homes, places and locations, which may have gone undergone radical social change and political change. The new visionary brief for this building encompasses these complex issues, proposes a simple, beautiful, temporary home for the study and display of historical artifacts. Located in Kumasi, which was pivotal to the slave trade, colonialism and struggle against British Empire, the GRT and its allied educational and research institute is to be a place where objects speak to one another and to their multiple audiences, whether locally, nationally, and internationally. It will also create an environment where, above all, people of all races and cultures may recognize and reflect upon the history of kidnap and plunder. Appreciating human ever beauty and the architecture of the gallery for returning treasures is to make a powerful statement of resilience, reconciliation in addressing the brutality of the past. The spaces will offer a sense of confidence and the promise of well being in anticipation of Africa. This is the central purpose of the building. In 2020, the brief and the design are reborn and re-envisioned as the GRT located <coughs> in Kumasi City Hall complex. There are many dimensions to which, to which this new brief relates. Firstly, to research in the field of Black history in Africa. Secondly, to establish a gathering place for commemoration of loss, celebration of resilience and community gathering. Thirdly, to study, collect data, catalog, and prepare for the curation and care of precious objects and artifacts. Most importantly, the GRT and the Future Institute will act as a center of excellence on the African continent, a catalyst for lobbying and if necessary, raising funds for the purchase of treasures and artifacts in order that they may be returned to their countries of origin. So that's the end of the talk, and if I may, I will go to um, go to the, the slides themselves. Um, so, um, starting with slide number one, we're looking here at the cover for the original um, original brief invitation to students to submit their entries. Um, to the competition. Um, and then on the bottom right hand side um, is a three, 3D image of the Kumasi City Hall complex. And number two, slide number two, is, um, yeah, um, and, and just the presence of the British Empire um, uh, in everyday life. Um, so this is very near where I live and memories of empire of India. Um, the slide in the middle, uh, the picture in the middle is of Queen Victoria and her, um, her, her aide, um, Mohammed Abdul Karim, who's, who was with her for the last 14 years of her life as her teacher, the Munshi, um, much reviled by her family, but much loved by her. 
Um, so this is another dimension to the empire, to, to um, the, the way that empire worked, not always in a completely negative way. Um, slide number three, please. Um, so this, this slide shows the dimension of um, what at school we used to call the pink bits of the map, which, of which you know, there was a great deal at, um, the world over. And, and the extraordinary fact that a small archipelago floating in the North Sea was governing so much of the world, um, the world and its cultures, um, including uh, 40 or so forts on the west coast of the, um, of the old Gold Coast. Um, which is now Ghana. And um, the work of um, Pa Joe, who is a self-taught artist, and Black Office, Forts and Castles, slide number four, please. Um, Forts and castles on the coast of Ghana, um, which we came and made in his workshop in Teshi in Ghana. Number five, slide number five shows um, some, some of the very careful, um, detailed work in um, which scholars who um, accompanied some of the British expeditions um, made of local cultures. So um, drawings of chieftains, chiefs and their regalia, um, the, the stool, the golden stool on the right, not the golden stool, but a golden stool, um, which is currently in Pitt Rivers Museum, which was taken in the War of 1870. 1873-4 by Garnet Woolsey's troops. Um, and here the architecture of Kumasi as, um, as the, uh, the British troops, um, the British um, scholars um, studied um, during that time and the beautiful carvings on the domestic and civic architecture. Um, tall buildings, beautifully crafted and beautifully carved. And on the eighth slide, we see more, more um, instances of the architecture of Kumasi. And it being an empire, we can see the, um, the war drums, the Ashanti war drums and regalia of war. We can see some um, rather fearsome looking skulls, which I imagine are um, the um, trophies, trophies of war. Um, so the Ashanti had their own empire, which came face to face with the British Empire. Um, and in the ninth slide, we see Sir Garnet Woolsey, who was Governor General of the Gold Coast, um, led many fearsome and bloody campaigns, many, many people um, killed under his watch. Um, he was also the subject of a comic song by Gilbert and Sullivan, um, the very model of a modern major general. And apparently he was such a fearsome disciplinarian that the term all, all Garnet Woolsey was adopted in his honour. And um, he, um, in 1875, 1874-1875, he was the Governor General of the Gold Coast. 25 years later, in slide number 10, we see Queen Mother Nana Ya Asantua, who um, fought the British over the golden stool. They demanded the golden stool, which was um, sacred to the Ashanti, and Nana Ya Asantua refused to hand over the golden stool and um, led a campaign against the British. Um, she was kidnapped and um, captured. And in slide number 11, we see an image of the exile in the Seychelles with King Prempe and his court. And um, they returned 
they were allowed to return to the Gold Coast in the early part of the 20th century. Um, so in the Seychelles, there are many descendants, many proud descendants of the Ghanaians who were exiled there. And we scroll forward to 1957 in slide number 12, where we see um, Kwame Nkrumah and the Big Six celebrating um, independence. Um, and at the bottom left, you can see some of the celebrations, the jubilation and the lightness of being, the joy and the celebration of freedom, which I remember as a child and um, dancing the high life, which was Ghana's um, own special dance. There is a story that, um, that Kwame Nkrumah was going to dance with the Duchess of Kent, who you see in her royal regalia in um, slide number 13. And he didn't know how to dance the foxtrot. So he was taught to dance the foxtrot by Louis Armstrong's wife um, and displayed um, his skill in 1961 when the Queen came to visit. And um, so in slide number 14, we see um, more evidence of the celebrations of independence. So we see the great um, E.T. Mensa, um, who was the king of the high life. We see the queen, um, Her Majesty the Queen, dancing with our president, Nkrumah. And again, the um, high celebrations. Um, and Richard Nixon, um, shown in slide number 15, were guests of honor. And independence. Um, the, royal, the royal umbrella on and slide number 16, we see on the left hand side um, a, a royal um, umbrella which was taken during a campaign and similarly um, a royal umbrella over the two dignitaries, the Queen and the new president of Ghana, so the empire and the republic um, under the shelter of the great umbrella of state. Um, and, and then the importance of infrastructure in Ghana, we have been talking about a little bit in our previous um, interview about the importance of infrastructure and on the right hand side, you see the Volta Dam, which was one of the great projects which was um, completed under Kwame Nkrumah's um, presidency. Um, the ports of Takaradi and Tema, um, which actually knocked the stuffing out of local communities, fishing communities, and boating communities, like Jamestown, where Just Ghana's office is. I was stationed at the moment working on regeneration in Accra. Um, but you can see that these, uh, these boats, these boatmen are the people who used to ferry the goods in from the ships, which were laid off the Gulf of Guinea. Um, and the economic livelihood has been effectively removed from that community. Um, so the the empire meets the republic um, and here on the basis of equality, which I think is something which is much missed, um, that the newly independent African country, which considers itself to be equal in every way to the old empire and the transition which is being made from one to the other. And here we have uh, His Royal Highness Nana Osei Tutu the the second Otumfo, who is the present Asante Hini King of the Ashanti, uh, or the Asante, as we should say properly, um, in his palanquin, um, and the. Uh, 
the Victoria and Albert Museum holds a great deal of this, <coughs> of the, the regalia that comes from uh, the Asante Wars. Um, and these are the subject, um, subject of um, return. Uh, these are the artifacts um, which are the subject of the request for return. Um, and this beautiful golden head, which is held in the Wallace collection. Um, together with um, beautiful gold work. And the Ashantis were um, renowned <coughs> in Europe, Africa and Asia as workers of fine gold. Um, and um, so these pieces that you see here are, are measures for gold. Um, there are um, soul washers, um, which are uh, regalia for military, the, the, the royal military. Um, and then we see here um, a, a, the, the school which was commissioned by Governor Gugisberg, one of the great reforming governors of the Gold Coast, who built infrastructure, built architecture, commissioned schools and colleges. And um, this, this is one of the buildings which is being offered by the Asante Hini as part of the return restitutions program as a possible um, place for the new institute location to the new institute. And so, um, so we go back to um, the um, 3D and the section of the proposed Kumasi City Hall complex. We have been working on this project for quite a long time and uh, <laughs> And you probably find that those of, those of us who work in Africa um, have to be very, very patient. Um, and the great thing about projects that take a long time is that I think they hopefully get better as time progresses. And, uh, and eventually when, it, when it's built, it is a, a fit a, a project which is fit for its location. And, um, for the uses that are intended. So I've come to the end of my slides, and if I may, Chisara Agor, um, with whom I've been collaborating on um, a project led by Claire Farrow and Nick Luscombe for Music City, which is part of the London Festival of Architecture. And this com composition was inspired by um, Nanaya Asantua, her struggle in the war of the Golden Stool and um, her eventual exile across the sea to the Seychelles, where she died.
found herself in Batakari, held up by empire, picked up rifle, the last stand for a mother's land. While golden tears fell on the gold coast, and he who led, named hero of his dominion, came face to face with the woman of the kingdom. It's a beautiful piece. I, I managed to 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 hear it uh, in live stream. It's a wonderful piece. Um, I, I, after this, you're gonna have the chance to have a small short Q, Q and A in private with some of our students and faculty. Um, I know it's too late, but may, maybe maybe we, before we wrap up the live stream, more public part of your presentation. Uh, thank you for it. Fantastic, uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Beautiful work. Uh, I, I may have one uh, one question which I, I struck to me as a very interesting thing, how you describe, and I think how you position the relation between objects, um, behavior of the objects in relation to politics. Um, and I wonder if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that, because it's, it's very interesting that you create very carefully which, which are the objects, and you're associating them with the, the political relationships between the empire and the republic and so on. Uh, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that. Oh, well, that, that's a very, really big question, and I haven't really thought about it in those terms before. You, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, it, it seems like uh, uh, that there is a, there is an implied symbolism in, in these objects that allows. Uh, and again, maybe I'm misreading how how you present it, but but it seems like that some of these symbols are an intersection between the, the friction of this political scenario, right? Because in a way, in, in any empire republic relation, is in the surface seems to be like a, an harmonious one, but it's under this a lot of boil and, and friction and unrest. And, uh, and in a way, the, the, the objects are very beautiful, but at the same time, it seems to have uh, an underline. So again, maybe maybe I'm reading too much into it. Maybe that's that's not what you meant. But but uh, they they seem so specifically curated by you. So I, I was wondering if, they, if you see some connection between the these things as as apparatus in relation to politics. Maybe it's not. As I said again, <clears throat> maybe I'm projecting. Well, I'm just learning about that myself because. I had assumed before I started looking at these objects in detail that the, the capture of the objects was by one um, incredibly dominant empire against um, a, a, a subjugated people. But actually, it was the confrontation between two empires. So the Asante had their own empire which was vast and stretched all the way to Togo, Ivory Coast, bits of Benin, 
And the, the war was really about one empire confronting another empire and refusing to be subjugated. So it, it wasn't um, the great British empire against a victim people. It was um, two empires challenging each other face to face. Um, and the fact that if you look at um, some of the objects, if you look at the war shirt, which was worn by Queen Ya Asantua, and you compare that as a queen, you compare that to the, the, the costume that Queen Victoria was wearing. I mean, this was, this was a soldier prepared for war in, um, in, a, in a culture which was considered to be backward. She was holding a gun. She was holding um, a, a, a Lee Enfield rifle, which was made not far where I'm, I am now in, in, the, in England. Um, and the, the, uh, the Empress, <coughs> the woman who was leading the British Empire is actually a little old lady, you know, who's completely swathed in, in fabric in which she's complete, she's, she can't move. So, you know, the question is who, who is subservient and who is free? And I think that goes right the way through the objects as well. You know, when you look at the, you look at the, the work, the work, the fine work in, that, in those gold pieces, they were bought by the Victorian Albert Museum because they wanted, they felt that people in, in England, artisans were moving too far away from the capacity to do fine work. So, so this was to say, look at the work which is coming from this particular place. But, in, but then, then you get a position where an, a story is invented, a rationale is made to say, we've taken these objects because these people who made the fine objects aren't capable of looking after them themselves. So, we as a superior culture have to take these objects away from the people who made them because they're not competent to look after their own belongings. So it's quite an interesting um, psychological mechanism to justify the theft of other people's work and and the negation of other the the negation of the status of other people's culture and i think that runs through through to to today you know where cultural appropriation is justified on the basis that you know one culture can do it better than the culture in which it originated you know you look at rhythm and blues you look at pop music i mean it's the same kind of rationale and so I think the, the restitution, the return of these objects to their original location um, and to uh, restores a, a meaning to the objects in that culture, but it also re restores a level of political power to the originators, which then um, I think echoes through the diaspora. Thank you, thank you for that answer. Um, and, and the other question I have before we, we, we wrap up this one, um, Elsie, is uh, that that some the, the the music piece is is absolutely mesmerizing. So um, I'm I'm curious because you're talking about that you're going to be collaborating. So I, if you can tell us a little bit more about how, how this collaboration is going to take shape or where it's going with, uh, that, that, I, I wonder that, what is the relation of architecture with that music. Well, that is the collaboration because, um, oh, yeah, and it and it uh, came okay. It, it came out of a conversation, and I wasn't expecting it. I thought that there was going to be a series of conversations, but it actually came out of a conversation with the composer, with Chisara, where I was just describing um, the Queen Mother, Nana Ya Asantua, and her role in the the War of the Golden Stool. 
Um, so even, even better. Sorry, I misunderstood you. <laughs> right. So, so I mean, you know, I don't want to make it too banal, but the narrative is that there's a reference to a gun, the shooting. Um, so that obviously is the war. Um, there's fire. There's water. Um, there's the exile across the sea, and you, you know the sound of the water because um, the Ashantis are far, far inland. So unless you were taken to the sea, um, you would you would probably go from one end of your life to another without ever having seen the sea. So so to be taken out of her culture and to be put on a boat and sailed hundreds of miles away. So the story was that, firstly, um, the, the, the Santa King was exiled to Sierra Leone, which is hundreds of miles away, but people were walking to Sierra Leone to pay homage. Um, so they thought, well, we'd better get some water between these guys and, and, their, um, and their country people. So that's why they ended up in the Seychelles. So then she was exiled to the Seychelles as well. So that, that's the um, connection between fire and water and guns and also the mention of the Batakari, which is the war shirt, which has spells, um, sacred spells sewn into it as not just as a physical armour, but also a spiritual armour. So if you look at that jacket that she's wearing, um, it's... Um, it, it, it's supposed to it's supposed to protect protect the body and to protect the the, the spirit and the soul as well. Um, so if you showed that to um, somebody who was of that culture, they would be able to read that garment as you would read a book. Um, but if you see it in a museum, you think, oh well, that's a nice garment, and it's got bits and pieces all over it. That there is no real understanding apart from the elegance and the beauty, which is only part of the story. That's that's beautiful. Again, my apologies. I thought that there was an ongoing collaboration. I didn't know that it already was complete. Um, yeah. I misunderstood when you when you said. Well, I hope there will uh, be. I, I hope there will be more. But yeah, even better. Um, but I think that what you just said about the garment, and, and, and now I'm thinking the relation between the garment and the music and all these different ways to communicate, I, I think this is, um, that is absolutely uh, interesting in terms of what is the possibility, how through the eyes of an architect, how these things kind of start to come into play. And there is a, a series of relationships that you start to establish. They're kind of hidden. Yeah, um, yeah, and th that I, I find it uh, like what you're talking about the garment to, to read the garment almost the way that you would read a book. Uh, that um, I never thought about that in those terms. So I think that, that that's a beautiful day. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because an as an architect, when you start training, you wonder how people can read plans. You know, you watch you watch experienced architects reading plans, and you think. Well, how do they know that? Just looking at that piece of paper. And then yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. position, and then you don't remember ever having not been able to read plans. So, you know, so you can you can put a plan in front of an architect and they can walk themselves through a building in silence. And that's a magical thing to be able to do. But that that level of communication isn't it, it is something that goldsmiths can do, that carvers can do, that anyone with a skill has that magic, that magical communication. And I think that's something really precious about architecture is that once you learn that skill in architecture, you can apply it to other magicians, if you like. Um, and and there's that, that silent communication then begins to exist between architects, public realm, um, artifacts, all sorts of other, um, other things that people make have that um, magic embedded and imbued in, in, in objects. 
I think that's a beautiful way to finish um, the, the the public live stream. Uh, as 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 I said, we're going to have a, a, another another little forum, which replaced. Unfortunately, we we would love which is to have dinner with you here in Los Angeles after the <laughs> lectures. So what we're going to do after what we're going to do now is going to be uh, a digital version of that dinner. But uh, I, I think what you just said about architecture and the magic of architecture, I think that's a wonderful way to finish it. Um, I, I want to thank you so much again for staying so late and for sharing with. Uh, this this lecture with us um, here again in our first lecture of the year. Um, so I'll, I'll see you in a bit. For everybody else watching, thank you for joining us. Um, please give a let's give a, a, a round of virtual applause for Elsie Owusu. Uh, terrific! Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you.